Welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. In this podcast, we discuss the exciting science behind HRV and how you can apply it to your own health and the work that you do. Just a note, this podcast does not replace medical advice, and if you're going to apply this to your own life or others, please consult with a medical provider. Thank you and enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. I am Matt Bennett. I am just flying solo real quick here to introduce uh, this episode uh, of In the Wayback Machine still with Kurt, uh, Jerry, and myself uh, talking about heart rate variability. Um, you know, it's so fun to look back at these. Uh, I, this idea in this, uh, this episode that, that I thought really snagged me pretty big is the connection between heart rate variability and social engagement. Um, I really saw coming out of this episode some big benefits of understanding where the person is in that moment and really crafting our interventions around a person's psychological and biological state. So going back and listening to this, I can almost see the epiphany of uh, optimal HRV uh, popping into my head. Uh, and I think as you listen to this, uh, some great science here. We'll um, uh, put the article in the show notes as well. But uh, some really great stuff here. Uh, it's so much fun going back and learning of it. And you can kind of watch the epiphany grow in this episode. But really great study on this too. And I think really uh, helps us look at how we integrate uh, heart rate variability into programming. So enjoy this episode. Again, uh, it's a few years back, uh, sound quality. Uh, I think at one point I needed to tell Kurt to scoot up to the mic a little bit more. So uh, hang in there. It does get better a little bit throughout. Uh, but uh, my production values hopefully have increased just a little bit over the years. So enjoy this episode. So we got this article today. Uh, you know, uh, we got it. Seemed like a lot of variables going on here. We we have heart rate variability, a stressful life event, uh, social support, and depression. Uh, so <laughs> there's there's kind of for for kind of a, a study with a few hundred people, there were a lot of variables going on. So uh, Kurt, I'll, I'll kind of hand it over to you to to kind of put these variables together and. I think this article can spur a lot of discussions, especially around uh, that social support piece. Yeah, and toss in their social engagement as another. Yeah, 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 there's five. <laughs> yeah, I mean, thinking about the, the basic premise of the study was um, they're going on the, the theoretical assumption, uh, which has a lot of good data behind it, that cardiac vagal control has a big impact on uh, depressive symptoms and the expression of the development of and the expression of depression symptoms. And so the, the way that, and, and actually their measurement device or the, the method that they use to measure heart rate variability is a different one that, that we haven't talked about before, this measure of respiratory sinus arrhythmia, yeah. uh, which are fluctuations in, in your heart patterns based on when you inhale and when you exhale. Uh, there are some variations in heart rate variability that happen. Uh, as a result of that. And that's an, another way that's, that's, I mean, it's real similar to a lot of the measures we've been using, which are the high frequency band of a power spectral analysis. And some of those things that are just, that's enough detail that, you know, we don't need to get into that. But um, so basically there's enough overlap between those two measures to make some comparisons between the studies we have talked about and this study. So their, their premise was, that with the ideas that when depression symptoms happen as a result of stressful life events, then a lot of the prevailing view has been that if we just provided enough social support, that we could help to manage depression symptoms. And they wanted to ask the question of, is that, is that true? And does heart rate variability or our physiology have an impact on um, how well we can access social support and how well social support can have an impact on us. Um, and to boil it down, the, the question, the answer was yes. And in, in a variety of ways, and in some pretty interesting ways. So they had recruited, this is actually done in the Denver area, which is kind of fun being in this area to think that it was done in, in uh, you know, recruiting subjects in the, in the hospitals and the laundromats of, of Metro Denver is kind of fun to think of. 
Um, so they recruited, a, a, you know, I think the number was 130 uh, by the end of, of weeding some, some subjects out of the study. Uh, people who had experienced a qualifying stressful life event and who had experienced depressive symptoms and then categorized those two into high heart rate variability or high RSA and low heart rate variability or low RSA. And then also further categorize those groups by uh, their social environment being characterized as high in social support or low in social support. Um, the social support part, I think there's a detail in there that I think is really, really pretty interesting. Uh, at least it was to me when I first read it and that they used um, a, a questionnaire, an assessment tool that gave some subscales or some characterization and further categorization of social support in terms of what types of social support are important. And I thought this was a really great part of the study that I took away from when we think about social support as having components to it that are important, like having somebody that you can call when you have material needs as a part of social support, or having somebody that you can um, get a validation social support need, somebody you can just talk to and, and that, that you can vent to. And then there's also this um, part of social support, which is a companionship social support, somebody to do things with. Um, so I thought that was a really interesting part of this study that um, I've used that for um, now it, for several years since I read this and how we think about asking people questions about what's your social environment like and where are the missing holes in your social support system. I thought that was a great thing to pull out of this, out of this article. So then they looked at um, whether or not you had high or low social support among these two groups of high or low heart rate variability and whether or not the, the individuals in either one of those groups engaged in social support, whether or not they engaged in behavior that, that accessed that social support. And I thought that was a, a really cool thing to bring into this that was a great overlap for me between the two worlds that we talk of often of there's a behavioral perspective and there is a, a, a therapy perspective um, that in this one, it's, it's awesome that the social engagement, which is engaging in social behavior, um, didn't necessarily happen whether or not social support was available. And a lot of what predicted that was heart rate variability or our physiology. And it was very predictive of whether or not, even in a high social support environment, if, you're, if your physiology wasn't in that high RSA group, people didn't tend to engage in behavior that, to access the social support. Um, and if they did, it almost blocked the effects of social support. And so your, your physiology then um, enhances or, or can detract from the impact of social support on depressive symptoms. So I thought that was really, a really interesting way to look at, um, at depressive symptoms and the impact of social support and um, what we can do, some of the things that we can do about engaging in and encouraging and motivating behavior that is consistent with social engagement or accessing social support in our environments and give us a little understanding for even though we are providing environments that are that are high in social support why uh, it may be difficult for some patients to actually access that <clears throat> support. Um, so some great things to kind of pull out of that but that's kind of a general overview uh, of what the study was and what some of the results were um, this has been one of one of uh, I'm kind of picking my favorites as we go through these and this is obviously right in there and I love the the ideas of thinking about um, social support and a social environment being different than the behavior of social engagement and thinking about those as different intervention points, I, I thought was one of the great things to pull away from, from this article. Um, what are you th your thoughts? You know, I, <clears throat> I, I think that uh, the, the differentiation um, between the availability of resources and the capacity to engage in action to access those resources <clears throat> is, a, is a very um, relevant to um, working with and understanding the impact of trauma. Is that many of the 
clients that I've worked with over the years uh, develop certain <clears throat> expectations, develop certain um, phobias, fears, anxiety about in, engaging in certain behaviors <clears throat> either because it's associated with their trauma or <clears throat> it in some ways um, activates an experience inside of them that they don't want to deal with, right? And so this, uh, this conditioning that goes on when we're exposed to adversity, especially in the context of interpersonal relationships, kind of gets associated with certain behavioral defensive strategies that, that in some ways protect the individual. But what we know is in the long run is they interfere with their ability to heal and recover from those, right? And so in, if we kind of um, understand that in some ways and understand that Initially, the trauma was some type of external event that was happening, but really it gets reenacted over and over again in a, either in a cognitive event that impacts our biology, and then in some ways our biology, our reaction to the environment is what maintains it. So in, in this sense is putting lots of social resources available to an individual when their biology is not signaling safety, they can't access them, right? Um, and so I think the takeaway for me is you have to work both with somebody's social environment but you also have to kind of be sensitive um, and to providing them either physical behavioral ways to change those um, internal states or in some ways uh, cognitive ways to change those internal states. So you, you can't do one or the other that it really takes a comprehensive, which means that oftentimes working with individuals who are traumatized is a very complex process where there's um, oh, sometimes competing um, variables, right? So the competing is, is we're trying to be helpful and supportive, but the individual is actually getting activated by that, right? And if we're not providing those supports, the individual is left alone. So it becomes very, very difficult. And I think having frameworks, as this article gives us, it begins to help us understand how we have to address um, these complex issues with a more comprehensive um, clinical approach. Those frameworks, I, I, I certainly find, I think this may be an oversimplification, but at times, sometimes you, you need a framework to just help you to keep at it, essentially. Just keep right. trying. <clears throat> under, trying to understand and keep trying to um, get more nuanced in, in the interventions that we're attempting next. And um, keeping right. that motivation is often one of the largest challenges of, of, of supporting people who experienced a lot of significant trauma. Right. Yeah, and no, I mean, it's it's... It's kind of, I, and I think a lot of this whole series is sort of, you know, bringing up the, the question is like, you know, heart rate variability in some ways seems like a reflection here uh, of, I, I don't know, it's like, well, what is, is, you know, is, are we looking at heart rate variability as sort of a reflection of their, their social health uh, and their mental health in, in some of the ways when you look at the, the stressful event and maybe their lack of social support slash um, engagement, um, you know, or is it in some ways, is it a reflection? 
Is it an, an equal sort of, we need to look at it both in kind of real time. Could we look at to improve depressive symptoms? Could we even, in, for some people, skip the social support altogether, even though I, I'm being a little, you know, over the edge with that, obviously, but then just really work on things that increase heart rate variability. Um, so so I, 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 I just kind of have this question about kind of, okay, is this, is this the chicken? Is this the egg? Are we talking about two chickens? Are we talking about two eggs? It's like, it's kind of like, you know, like in my own thinking, I, you know, with that very confused question, I wonder if either of you have any kind of thoughts. Again, as I measure my own thing, it seems like a reactive thing to things I do. Um, but yet I'm wondering if I keep over time doing things that help heart rate variability, if overall my scores will improve, which I think they would. So, you know, chicken, egg, egg, chicken, you know, any thoughts on that? Am I just totally off with this question? And one of the things that, that the article I, I thought was a great kind of theoretical piece from the article that talked about the similarities in the neuroanatomical systems involved with both managing cardiac control and with social engagement that they are overlapping neuroanatomical systems. And so that one, I think, is, is a really, really fascinating thing to think about that. Then your point is a really good one, right? Like, if we do things to change heart rate variability, that can really have a, a strong impact on our ability to engage socially. That, that's really important. But it's, that's not a, it's a change that happens in, in in a subtle way it's not like a that would take time and it takes repetition and it takes you know a lot of intervention and so that's goes back to that point that i was thinking about just keep at it and, and that's part of what we have to do is often keep at it for longer than we think that we have to you know you know what i matt i <clears throat> i think this um the 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 awareness that therapy tended to be so um, cognitive and verbally based, mm -hmm. right? And the thought was, if I could talk about what's going what's on, going on. Social, make social contact, I could get better, right? And I, and I think what this tells you is we can provide a change in state by engaging in certain types of action. And just right? for, for our listeners, a state is sort of a, a short-term mental, emotional. Right. Yeah. So, so a state, you could be in a state of hunger. You could be in a state of yeah. fear. You could be a state of joy. You could be in a state... Our states change, but by engaging in certain behaviors so that what we know is, is research on yoga impacts um, heart rate variability. We know that engaging in physical activity changes heart rate as you, as you do. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this expands the type of therapeutic possibilities that we can use to increase people's openness. So when I was at the, the, I was running a residential treatment center, we oftentimes prior to having some of this knowledge would put children in therapy and they'd be very, very resistant. They'd be very um, unable to effectively use it. They would be in a defensive state. And what we found was, is that it's not that therapy wasn't a useful intervention. But the children who had been traumatized, neglected, exposed to maltreatment, couldn't make effective use of that. Mm -hmm. But when we added yoga to the program and recreation and pet therapy, there seemed to be um, their ability to um, utilize the therapy time increased. Right, and, and if we didn't have a study like this, we, we, we might not even connect those things, right. Right. right? It's like, oh, 
you know, it just was a matter of time and this, this child began to feel more comfortable and created a therapeutic alliance. But really what I think was happening is we were providing pattern repetitive rhythmic activities that was helping these children regulate their bodies right. to in some ways come to therapy in a different state, which changes their perception and expectations that allowed them to make better use of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when you're developing programming, you think about, well, I could just do 50 minute hours of therapy and then put them in group therapy. And right. I just bombard them with therapy, but really the exposure to these kind of uh, activities was a very important component of the therapeutic intervention that allowed them to begin to make use of the social engagement systems, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's where these types of articles is helping us beginning thinking about programming is how do we begin to not just increase people's social systems while being in a room with somebody or being in a group therapy session, whatever, but how do I help them engage in, behave, in actions that help them feel safer in their bodies and the signals from their bodies are sending signals that I could be open and flexible and responsive to my environment and then I can engage in systems that actually activate kind of uh, ways in which I can interact with my environment mm -hmm. as opposed to defend myself against the environment. And that's a significant change in state. Exactly. Does that does that make some yeah. sense? So, so in, in some ways, the yoga was the egg and the social engagement support was the chicken? So you're trying to fit it into your <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> right. so whenever you do that, Matt, I have a simple like, mind, oh, Jerry. I have a simple mind. <laughs> However you do that is right. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if, well, if, for maybe, maybe some other people the therapy because they they because again we see a lot in the trauma research and i don't want to i think sometimes our discussions what we're sort of looking um for the new information is is i don't want people to take out well well the social support the relationship isn't important because there's tons of you know research that says you know it's kind of uh, for for some people, it may not, you know, again, it, it may look different than just connecting with them in, in, a, in that way. And so maybe for therapy, for some folks, that actually helps, that social engagement helps uh, their variable heart rate. So I, I have another thought about this, kind of think about it, right? So there was a time in which um, they child welfare, child welfare, nationally really has three primary goals that they look at. They look at the issue of safety, they issue, look at the issue of permanence, and they look at the issue of well-being, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, we think picking a child up and moving them to a new home where there's nice people is adequate enough to address the issue, right? Then what we say is, oh, really what we have to do is find a forever place to do it, and that's what to do it. But really, the, the key really is, is that these issues work simultaneously together, is that if, a, if that child isn't, we're not working on their well-being, their bodies and what's going on with them, they can't feel safe in those environments. And if they can't feel safe, they're engaging in behaviors that are going to decrease the probability of it being permanent, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> so when you're kind of coming up with interventions, you have to address all of those issues, yeah. right? Is that if I have a child who doesn't have any place to belong or doesn't have any connectedness, and I'm working on their well-being, probably they're not going to make a lot of progress in life right? To kind of look at that to be successful. If I just create a social environment for them without addressing some of these uh, physiological, biological needs, of it, uh, they're not going to. So how do we take these components 
and add it into, if I just put you in a home and you're homeless, that's not adequate in order to make the changes we're looking at, mm -hmm. right? Or if I just give you a meal, <clears throat> oftentimes you should be happy that I now put you in an apartment because now I've, I've given you access to these resources, right? But really what this is telling us is sometimes these individuals can't effectively make use of and access these resources because we haven't changed something internally. Great. Kurt, what are, what are your thoughts? Especially, I, I think, as someone who thinks about designing, you know, I kind of thought about it like designing environments with, with the behavioral support things that you do. And I kind of wonder, you know, I know social support a lot of times are part of those environments, obviously, in big ways. But I just kind of, how's this kind of been informing you about, about those pieces as well? Well, so let's let's kind of step into. Um, I'm think I was thinking about schools actually while while Jerry was talking, and, and one of the things that um, that happens in schools, and I think it's mandated at this point for IEPs, is to do uh, a functional behavior assessment. And that you have to do that as you design a behavior intervention plan and you design a support system around an IEP. And this idea of changing states is so important to this functional behavior assessment and it's just not included right now. I mean, I was trained as a behavior analyst to do functional behavior assessments and we're just not trained in this and I think it's really important that we are. So if we think about, I wanna try and give an example that, that highlights how important this is. So let's take this issue of, of heart rate variability and safety and the difference that one single, the same environmental event or the same environmental cue can have entirely different meanings based on where we are in terms of our physiology. So as Jerry was alluding to, you can take uh, a child who has been through incredibly traumatic and, 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 and unpleasant experiences, who their, their physiology is now <clears throat> at a state of arousal where anything that is ambiguous to them, anything that they don't know exactly what it is, is interpreted as a threat. So you put them into a home with a lot of food and a lot of warmth and a lot of social engagement and a lot of people who want to touch him and a lot of people want to hold him and want to like engage with them. Now all of those things don't feel safe as opposed to if their physiology is different, right? If they're, if they get into a, into a state where they're now down the arousal continuum, where they're not in an alarm and a fear state, those same events, have an incredibly different meaning, 180 degree, 80, 80 degrees different meaning. And now they can engage in that. So as we think about what we're doing when we think about like a functional behavior assessment, right? In, in those two situations based on that individual state, one behavior may be, the function of it may be attention. It may be actually accessing social support. On the other hand, that the function of a behavior may be escape and avoidance. Right? Based on their state, you would have a complete change, a 180 degree change in what the function of behavior is. Mm -hmm. And that's a really important thing to overlay on top of some of the interventions that we do. So you may have behavior that is regulatory in nature, that would be in, in, a, in a functional behavior mm -hmm. assessment, we'd call that automatic reinforcement. Right, so that may be the function. And in another situation, that may be, uh, the function may be actually getting people to engage with you socially. So that's, it's really important, I think, as a, as a <coughs> way of overlaying some thought and, a diff and, a, and an additional lens on top of this idea of functional behavior assessment, which, and I'm not saying FBAs are bad, they're great. Actually, they're really helpful. Because one of the, they help us a lot with um, one of the things we kind of do naturally as human beings is infer intent on the part of another person based on environmental cues and what their behavior is and on our own learning mm -hmm. histories. And being systematic about that helps us be better about inferring intent. It gives us a better guess, essentially. And now we have different, even better information about how state impacts function that's really important to overlay on top of that. So that's kind of one point. And, and the other one I want to make is about 
the, the idea we were talking about this a little earlier about positive repetitive experience and how um, those things help somebody to engage in a therapeutic intervention or make that therapeutic intervention more effective at a different point in time. And that's one of the things I think that's the most interesting about what I, I like to call the change moment, when we notice change happen, which usually is in retrospect. Like we're usually thinking about that later, right? Well, well that, that child just decided to engage or they, they developed a therapeutic alliance and that became a magical kind of moment. And it's so fun that that appears to be this magical kind of moment. But what it really is, is the, the cumulative effect of a whole bunch of experiences leading up to it that we probably did not notice. And when we look back on it, we're like, oh, that was the point at which that made the difference. And that's, that's, that was the important moment for me. Um, and that happens to us. That's our experience of that moment. Like when we talk about that, we're not lying. We're not making it up. It's not some kind of, we're not trying to be inaccurate with it. It's just the way that our brains and our bodies and our attention systems work. That's what we notice. So it seems magical. But all of those things Jerry was talking about, about putting in positive, repetitive events as a part of our programming, they just keep increasing the probability of those magical change moments happening. And they do it in a very targeted way. And so that's a great way to inform program design is we know now what changes and what can have an impact in a positive direction on heart rate variability, which is, I think I like what you said, Matt, a lot about that it really can be a metric of the health of our social engagement system. And if we have a way of systematically creating programs that help us to improve that, but that's powerful. That's a, that's a huge thing to do. Um, and, and it's informed a lot of, I think, what, um, what I've done and, and what people that, that I know like, who do it well, it really informs a lot of the decisions that they make on a moment-to-moment, -moment, day day-to-day basis about their programs. You, you know, uh, as you were talking, one of the thoughts that came to my mind is that we have these multiple systems, right? So we have defensive systems. We have social engagement systems. We have systems that are designed to regulate our physiological energy, like seeking food and seeking uh, water or, right, to kind of, and that in order to be successful in adapting to our environment, we have to both activate certain systems and we have to inhibit certain systems, right, to kind of manage that so that in a way, in order to um, access the richness of our social environment, we have to downregulate our defensive systems and we have to upregulate our social engagement systems. That's a fairly complex process, right? It's not just, oh, okay, it's here and I, and I go after it, but I've got to have some mechanism to downregulate my ability. So if I, you know, thinking about just sitting um, with a group, I, and I was thinking about just sitting in it with a group of individuals having a meal, I've got to be able to activate a system that allows me to, to, di to eat and digest to get energy. That's a system in itself, right? And then I've got to have the ability to socially engage while I'm doing that. But then I've got to downregulate my defensive system so that I don't like attack somebody at the table to, or <laughs> when they reach to, towards your food. <laughs> I, that, that, that little task is a very complex biological process, right? And so if I don't have my body in a state or my or my expectations of what's going to happen to that experience is going to be I have to be in a state of defensiveness or I have to be it's going to be really difficult even though I put the food on the table right that that is one piece of it but really getting people and you know you think about matters you'll think back to when we used to have these dining room with kids where there were so many kids and so many variables going on, and then a kid would blow up and they'd get consequent into kind of, is like to be able to, to calm yourself 
in that environment and to be open to socially engaging why I'm eating for a kid who where food was unavailable or you know it was like if I didn't get if I didn't get my food somebody else was going to take it from me I mean that is a complex really that we don't really put a whole lot of thought into how to designing it yep yeah yep yep well, after uh, I uh, was uh, at a high school last night uh, when uh, class went out before presentation uh, yesterday evening, and I just being in a high school hallway just regulated the heck out of me. Uh, and, you know, I had a nice drive up, looked at some mountains all the way to, to Colorado Springs and Fountain, and it's, you know, it, it's still, I think uh, a lot of these, you know, I've been thinking a lot about <clears> – <throat> you know, transitions in education as well, you know, and I think we all, we all go through these when different environments and, and you think about these young kids, you know, they're, they're such a different environment in art class than in PE, than in math. Um, sometimes I've been talking to my wife about this is like, you know, sometimes there's rules for the classroom, but then you have indoor recess and those rules change dramatically as well. And so, you know, again, kids that are, have some of those, resources build up, come from healthy homes, have had that healthy attachment, can handle those fairly fairly well. Um, but again, a lot of the kids that, that, that we see really uh, struggle with that into adulthood uh, too. I, I mean, some of these conversations just kind of, you know, one, it makes me really appreciate, uh, especially my work in special education when we had great occupational therapists we worked with, because that's, you know, a bouncy chair or you know, just these sensory integration things, I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that's, that's really in many ways what we're talking about is what, how can they help, help them, you know, in some ways self-regulate and have these different tools that when they identify, which is an easy, easy task in itself, that they're getting stressed out, that, that they can bring these to the front. But it, but it almost seems like, boy, we, we throw kids into residential treatment, we throw people um, into prison systems, and, and we don't have any of this kind of, you know, information about heart rate variability or and all these things that seem to be driving, should be driving treatment in a really major way. And, I, you know, I, I kind of, my question is like, you know, Jerry and, and both of you, I know all three of us have worked in uh, residential with, with children is like, you know, how, how long, if we don't have those kind of assessments up front in some ways, how long does it take and how many failures do we sometimes put the kids through before we know, hey, this kid just needs to be by themselves maybe for, you know, every hour they're in the cafeteria, they need at least 15 minutes by themselves to, to downregulate. Like, sometimes I, it feels like the cafeteria example, we, we're setting kids up in environments that their biology is nowhere close to ready to. I think I think about the um, those three categories of social support uh, that I mean, I, I think we can all resonate with the experience of having moments when what we need in terms of social support is not necessarily somebody to engage in a real deep discussion, but just when somebody's around mm -hmm. and not even talk. Right. I mean, think think about significant others. Right. How important that is that they're just there. You're not even talking there's just another person around. And I think that's one of the things that I kind of, I pull out of those three areas of social support as you think about your physiology. And I, one of the things that could be predictive of when that's the type of social support that you need may be heart rate variability. And it may be that when your heart rate variability is in a state where it's low and you're activated, I don't need to talk. I just need you to be around. And when I get regulated, then I probably want to talk a little bit, <laughs> but right now that's not what I need. So I, those things, I think the interaction between how we think about what our internal state is and what we need in terms of our social environments, I think is a really powerful thing to pull out of, a, out of an article like this and, you know, think about the point, you know, well, point well made about putting a whole bunch of kids with, um, low heart rate variability, essentially like elevated stress responses into a packed social environment that that's a challenge. And as Jerry, you know, pointed out really well, like we don't think about that stuff, you know, all probably as much as we could. And, and some, in some ways there are times when, even if we think about it, there's not much we can do about that. Like that may be just the structure that we have to do, 
but we can also be mindful of it as caregivers when we are in those situations when we're like, okay, I really need to support you right now. Like I'm here, I'm around, and I may not even be talking to you. Mm-hmm. And that may be what you need right now. And that doesn't mean that we're not providing social support. That may be the exact the type of social support that is needed in those moments. And I love the, the ability to have a physiological marker that can help us be predictive of that and, and informed about that. So that, I love those kind of points out of, out of an article like this. And is there any, like, you can, you know, because I, I, I'm sort of, I'm sure some of our audience is feeling like I'm feeling, it's like, well, what the hell do we do? Uh, because, you know, e- even I, I think with the Welltory app, it, it's, it's nice. I wouldn't suggest anybody use it as a clinical tool. I think it's a, it's a nice thing right now, maybe for self insight. I think if you put uh, one of the, maybe the running heart rate monitors, or you might get more information, but you're not necessarily getting real time in you know the technology unless you've got a major grant with like national institutes of health or something you're you're not you're not going to know the heart rate variability for for at least an individual i think most of our folks will not have any clue about heart rate variability within the folks they're working with and at the same time you know if if the cafeteria triggers your heart rate variability even if you have it you know you have to take a real time reading to get to know the the kids in there. So it's like, what what is, you know, around program design, we're, we're still kind of, are we still just kind of left as, we got to trial and error this out at this point? To, is there any like concrete things? Okay, this is how we can think about this today. Like this mm-hmm. is, we don't have the technology yet. We don't, we're not going to know heart rate variability. Again, we can get some, we got some apps, but there are, there are apps. So, so Matt, so Matt, you're raising a really important challenge, right? I think what you're raising is we're all looking for the how do we translate what we're learning in research to clinical application, right? And, and that's, a, that's the challenge we have. So we're learning that certain experiences alter your genetic makeup that is going to, in some ways, not only impact you, but impact the next generation, right? Epigenetics that we talked about on one of our episodes. Really great, um, that's a really insightful, great information. What's the, what's the clinical application of that, right? And, and I think that as we have these discussions and, and, and bring these topics up, Really, for me, what I end up thinking about is when, I, when I'm working with either a, chi- a child in a treatment center or I'm working with staff and they're reacting to these behaviors and their responses, if I just consequence this child, it's going to change, right? That, that's been our traditional. If you get misbehave and you blow up in the dining room, my, my, my response is, you are out of the dining room for three days, and now you can go back into it, right? Well, you lose recess for a certain amount of time. What it helps is <coughs> having a more, one is a uh, deeper understanding. Two is having a, co- a, a compassionate understanding of what that experience might be for that individual in that dining room. And three is, developing strategies that increase the likelihood of that child or that adult or that couple successfully engaging in behaviors that are going to be rewarding and adaptive for them. So we have to take this information and not just say, oh, okay, and now I go and do heart rate variability, is really what's, how do I adapt it to what I'm doing to give me more insight to be a better clinician or better case manager or better teacher to really begin to understand that. And I think that's the translatability of research and practice. And that's always the challenge, right? That's always the challenge. And hopefully that's what maybe we can provide because having a deeper understanding of this research allows us to help you translate it into something you could do. But really just going, getting a monitor and kind of taking your heart rate variability, that in itself is not going to be unaffected 
unless you say is, I begin to find some patterns in, in my own life that when I do these types of things, it changes my heart rate variability that makes it easier for me to socially engage, it makes it easier for me to downregulate my defensive systems. Then you could begin to use that data for your individual. Re- you are a, a one person research project, yeah. right? That That's where it might be helpful to you. So again, is if I have a client, I have, maybe I give them that information and we begin to help them look at, so tell me about when you were really upset yesterday and you took that measure, what did you learn about yourself and how do we begin to build in some strategies, how to look at that. But that's how I think we have to use research to inform us in some things about how we might better design programs to get better results. But some I, research I, is hard to translate. And, and I think this is difficult to translate. Right. Uh, it's, it's complicated. Like these are complex systems and these are kind of con- complex concepts to, to think about. But one of the fun things I think about having something that is this complicated using and you use it as an intervention is that in the process of leading <laughs> people, both clients and providers, along the pathway of understanding this kind of complexity. What I get most jazzed by, and and I think is some of the most enjoyable interactions are when, as we go through people integrating these ideas into their existing mental models and the way that they think about it, more creativity comes out of that. But I think I've learned more by sitting down with a, a young clinician or sitting down with uh, foster parent or you know a staff on a unit or with a client and we start talking about how their physiology impacts their behavior and how their the functions of behavior change like some of these concepts and as we talk about them and get into them and tie them back to their everyday experiences they come up with ways to apply it that I never would have thought of and that emerges from and that's part of the application of, of this clinically is talking about it and teaching about it and having discussions about it that tie it back to people's everyday experience. And boy, like I, I've seen foster parents come up with ideas about, oh, well, if that happens, then we can do this and that will impact their heart rate variability. And then like, yeah, great. I never would have thought of that. Let's do it. And, and they, they think about it differently, right? They're in those social environments every single day and are an integral part of those social environments. They will, they often have better ideas than I do about how to alter them or how to change them in subtle ways um, that is really fun to come out of and then I get to tell stories about it to other people <laughs> it's it's really an enjoyable intervention to do um, classrooms do the same thing and, um, people come up with really creative ways of applying some of this stuff. Kurt, Kurt, from from your um, background it would seem to me that really um, these defensive systems, these social engagement systems, these biological systems, they're context um, that an individual has to evaluate the context and activate certain systems and downregulate other systems. And that trauma interferes with the contextualization, the people's ability to adapt to the context that they're in. Yes. Right? It's right. not the problem of their defensive system We all have the defensive system, but we shut it off in order to activate a different system. But it's the the match between not being able to to accurately assess the current context and then somehow use that information to activate systems. So a trauma individual sees threat even when there's safety there, right? Right. Right. So, So, the, the issue really is, from your perspective, how to help these individuals more accurately assess the situation based on, as opposed to using past history to anticipate what's there or misperceiving so that they can activate the, cert, the, the correct system to act, ac- access really what it is that they really want in life, right? Yeah, that, that goes back to the last article we talked about, about that heart rate variability predicted the extinction of conditioned fear and the learning of new safety cues. Right. It, it interferes with that process, which is fundamental to, 
that's the that's indicative of the shutting down and the activating of systems that's what is the mechanism that underlies those learning processes and all of this right. the, our physiology so if, we're, if, yeah. we're, if we're thinking about sequencing treatment right is how do we create stability in the individual right when you is how do you get them feeling safe enough and regulated enough which is the first phase of most trauma treatment is about stabilization mm -hmm. before you start engaging in trauma processing to kind of looking at that piece and then really looking at future goals. And so there's a sequence to what we're learning across many. It's not, you know, it's not whether you pick this, but that's a, a kind of a principle that goes across many treatments mm -hmm. that you can't get engaged in this is how do you think that fits in kind of validates that process that we're learning that a lot of you can't do future orientated goal setting before you make somebody feel safe you can't reason before you regulate right 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 that, that all this stuff is really supporting those concepts yeah there's a there's just a ton of convergent validity on a lot of these approaches that as we under i think that's indicative of um being on the right track for understanding the mechanisms as things converge on on the same points um it gives you a lot of validity to to a lot of the models that we put together right so I, as <clears throat> as our listeners take this away sometimes rather than it when we talk about these <clears throat> complex topics it makes people feel like well now what do i need to do and and in a way I think is to go back to what you're already doing and ask yourself is what I'm doing, is it in some ways, the reason I'm getting good results is I'm already doing some of these things. Mm -hmm. I'm already paying attention to helping my clients find some stability and safety in their lives and structure and consistency. And then we're working on some building some skills and other kinds of things. And then we're, right, is that that is going to validate some of the things you're already doing, this, this research, as yeah. opposed to throwing the, you know, throwing everything out and starting over because I now have a new concept. Yeah. I think that's a great place to wrap up today. So Thank you for joining us for this episode. If you're interested in more information about HRV, please visit us at OptimalHRV.com. Also, if you visit OptimalHRV.com, you'll be able to sign up for our email list and download our free ebook, Healing with HRV. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next episode.